In the name of Christ, amen. Amen. We're going to spend some time in our gospel reading this morning in Matthew chapter 10, uh, beginning in verse 34. But I think we've all noticed that human behavior in general, and this of course carries on to churches, we tend to go to extremes. And the reasonable, the middle, or usually maybe the truth, is often very hard to stick with. We like our extremes. So this morning's gospel reading is is talking about two very important concepts of scripture, law and gospel, we like to call them. But I've noticed that we have a tendency to go to extremes in that area where where sometimes we have a, a church that just constantly shares the gospel. It, everything is, Christ died for you, you're a sinner, but you're forgiven, and Jesus rose, and, and, and God bless you, and that's it. Then there's the other side that just wants to constantly hit you with the law. Oh, you sinners. Oh, you better get your act together. Oh, you better be good. You better do this. You better do that. And it seems that there's always kind of this swing to extremes. Well, our text today, I think, gives us a wonderful, clear understanding of what the whole idea of obedience, of grace, of faith, these things that seem to be, you know, somewhat in contrast to each other, how they work together. Now, I want to start with an example that I think is wonderful for how this works. And I want you to know beforehand that I got permission to do this. Now, Davina Lance may not remember giving me permission, but you did. It was out by the donut table, and I had it notarized. Uh, but, um, and also, I've known Davina and Scott Lance for a very long time. And, and the real reason I, I love to use uh, them in an examples is uh, Davina likes to point out where my hair is thinning. And that I'm getting old, so got to get it back. But we were out having donuts last week, and very sadly, Davina was sharing that she had not been feeling well, and that her blood pressure dropped to almost nothing, and she passed out. And she was on the floor. Now imagine how horrible and scary that would be. But her poor husband Scott is standing there seeing all this, and of course he tries to pick her up and to, to help her, right? And he's explaining this to us, and I think he was pretty tired, maybe his filters weren't on as far as, um, you know, where he'd be sleeping that night. And uh, he just, just all of a sudden just said, you know, I, I, she fell and I tried to pick her up, but, uh, but that woman is a two-man job. <laughs> yeah, 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 imagine saying, yeah. And Davina's eyes got big, and I just went, this is awesome. This is great. This should be a t-shirt, you know. (laughs) Um, I thought it was hilarious. But he didn't just leave her there and say, oh, well. Got a hold of some paramedics, probably some very good-looking firemen, who came and took care of her. But here's why I bring this up, other than it's just amusing, and to get... Davina back for pointing out where my hair is thinning on Sunday morning. Here we have a husband and wife. And I happen to know that this husband and wife love each other dearly. And I happen to know that Scott adores Davina. Just adores her. Imagine how he felt when he saw his wife get sick, blood pressure drop, and go unconscious. Imagine the panic. Imagine how deeply and desperately he wanted to help her. Now this I know for a fact. Scott did not stand there and go, well, uh, she's passed out. Guess I can have some cake now. Uh, No. He didn't just say, "Eh, well, I'm busy. I'm going to leave her there. No. He wanted to help his wife. He loves her. He adores her. But he couldn't. As as he said, his wife is a (laughs) two-man job. 
I have to keep saying it. So what did he do? He called for help. And they helped her. Got her taken care of. And as far as I know, she is back to perfect and is not passing out anymore. Although her husband later <laughs> may not be in the same shape. But here's why this is such a great story. Here we have Matthew 10, which is an interesting, if not maybe, I don't know, convicting text. The central part of this text, whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me, can be a little disturbing. But let's start with verse 40 of our text. We have previously been talking about faith and grace, and now we're going to talk a little bit about something that is often called Christian living, sanctification, other words for it, just being in the faith. But we start with verse 40, or we are going to focus first on verse 40, where it says, whoever receives you receives me, and whoever receives me receives him who sent me. Receive, receive, receive. So our text starts with something we've been talking about in the last few weeks about grace and faith, that everything that brings us to heaven, we receive. We don't decide it, we don't go get it, we don't search for it, we, don't, we receive it. It's given. Galatians 3, 2. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Acts 2, 38. Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Our faith in and of itself, that which allows us to receive the salvation, the blood of the Son of God from the cross that forgives our sins and brings us to heaven, we are passive. We are vessels. We receive it. But here's the problem. As I've mentioned before, I have never once heard of somebody who hears the word of God and is baptized into the faith and is immediately zapped to heaven. In fact, I've never heard of anybody dying in their baptism, although I would love to find out if that ever happened. Can you imagine? That would be fascinating. I mean, honestly, what a way to go. Just boom. But I don't think it happens. We're left here. We're left here to live that life as somebody that is justified and redeemed as this vessel that has received this faith. And some people want to lead us to believe, well, that's it. Just, just sit there. You received it. Martin Luther, the great reformer, in his writing on, on the councils and churches, 1539, long time ago. They, uh, he was using DOS back then, it was so old. He writes this, I'm sorry, that was a lame joke. They, whoever they are, are preaching finally, and I can think of nothing else, with real seriousness about Christ's grace, the forgiveness of sins, and the other things that can be said concerning redemption. But they flee the consequence of this, as though it were the very devil, and will not speak to the people about the third article, which is sanctification, i.e., the new life in Christ. For they think that they ought not to terrify people or disturb them, but always to preach in a comforting way about grace and the forgiveness of sins in Christ, and utterly avoid such words as these. Listen, you want to be a Christian and yet remain an adulterer, fornicator, drunken swine? I like that, drunken swine. Okay, drunken swine, proud, covetous, a usurer, envious, revengeful, malicious. On the contrary, they say, listen, though you are an adulterer, a fornicator, a miser, or any other kind of sinner, only believe and you will be saved and need not fear the law. Christ has fulfilled it all. Tell me, is that not granting the premise and denying the conclusion? Nay, it is taking away Christ and bringing him to naught. At the same time that he is most highly preached, it is saying yes and no to the same thing. There is no such Christ who has died for these sinners, who after forgiveness of sins does not leave their sins, do not leave their sins and lead a new life. In other words, what Martin Luther is saying is that faith, which is totally 
passively received leads to faithfulness in life. We see this several places in our text. If we look at verse 41, the one who receives a prophet because he is a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. The one who receives a righteous person because he is a righteous person will receive a righteous person's reward. And whoever gives one of these little, little ones even a cup of cold water because he is a disciple, truly I say to you, he will be no, by no means lose his reward. This is talking about doing good stuff. Specifically about serving those who serve the Lord about being a part of the church, about helping others with the gospel. This is faithfulness. And it's doing something, in a sense. Then we get to verse 34 through 37, which is a little startling. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. Wait, what? Isn't Jesus just all about peace and love, harmony and cuddles? I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a person's enemies will be those of his own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And what this text is saying is that we do not have to visit our mother-in-laws. No, I'm kidding. That is not... Somebody is going to hear that and, and write that down. Say, the pastor said, no. Saying something actually much more difficult. Saying, you're not going to have peace with this gospel. This truth is going to go contrary to the world. In fact, your own family are going to hate you sometimes. But you remain faithful. Stand true to the doctrine of your faith even when the world says no. Even if they call you names, even if they say you're a bigot, even if they say that what you're doing is not loving and it's not peaceful, because you stand for the truth of Scripture, it's not going to be pleasant. Some of you have actually had to separate in some ways or not be welcomed by family because of the beliefs in Holy Scripture that you hold. But these parts of our text explicitly tell us that this faith, which is totally passive, comes through the Word of God by the Holy Spirit to even an infant. This faith leads to faithfulness. And if one says, I have faith, but no faithfulness, we have a problem. Well, what is faithfulness? Well, simply, verse 38, it's to follow. Whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Well, simply put, faithfulness is following Jesus. Now, obviously, we're going to fail in that. But the question is, do you even want to? Do you want to follow Jesus? Even if you can't pick up your wife off the floor, off the floor do you want to? Are you trying you know, a simple reason for this following, that a man who was considered to be the wisest in the world once said is, this is the only thing that makes life worthy. Ecclesiastes 2.10 said, I denied myself nothing my eyes desired. I refused my heart no pleasure. My heart took delight in all my labor, and this was the reward for all my toil. Yet when I surveyed all that my hands had done and what I had toiled to achieve, everything was meaningless, a chasing after the wind. Nothing was gained under the sun. If ultimately we are not following Christ, every other part of our life, all of our vocations, which are all important, all essential, Trust me, do not stop trying to earn money to pay the bills to eat and put a roof over your head. But if following Christ is not at the center of that, it is all meaningless. Meaningless. Faithfulness means to follow. But now, here's where it gets a little tricky. Verse 38, whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. I hear a lot of people talking about following Jesus. Remember the old fad, what would Jesus do? 
the bracelets, the t-shirts. What would Jesus do? What would Jesus do? Something very popular now in servant leadership uh, courses and things is it serving like being a leader like Jesus was a leader. Okay, I, he was a good leader. He was good at all sorts of things. But you ain't Jesus. Neither am I. Verse 38 says, follow him. But notice how. This is essential. You take your cross. What is that cross? Not any old cross. It's the cross of Christ. It's the cross of Christ which was in him and is in us. The dying of ourself. It's thy will, not my will, be done. It is a willingness to give over control of every ounce of our being to our God, even if it means our death. That's what it means to follow Christ. In other words, the only action that is required to follow, the only action that is required of faithfulness is the willingness to submit. There really is no action. In fact, following is dying, not doing. 1 Corinthians 1 23 but we preach Christ crucified a stumbling block to Jews a foolishness to Gentiles but to those whom God has called both Jews and Greeks Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God the Bible says follow be faithful here's how you ought to live as Christians your wife is on the floor She's sick. Help her. And if we are truly in Christ, we are going to want to do this. But he makes it very clear that the only way we can do it is not by our own abilities, but by his. Death to us, life from him. Whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. In other words, if you try to follow Jesus on your own, by your good behavior, by your efforts, by your extreme intelligence, you are still not worthy of him. The only one who is worthy is the son. And the only way we can be part of the son is the cross. I was at the Orange Lutheran High graduation this year, which I really enjoyed. It was a great graduation, and we had a, a, a student graduate, and I'm very, very proud of her. And, and, uh, and the graduation was beautiful and very well done. And keep in mind, this is at UCI at the Brin Center. It's not a worship service, but they had a wonderful uh, praise band and vocalist come up to sing a song. And uh, let me just say, I really like the song. In fact, I bought the song off iTunes and listened to it sometimes. It's a good song. However, it's a song that probably a lot of churches would use in worship. And I wonder if you can figure out why it shouldn't be. It's called Child of Love by We the Kingdom. And if you want a good song to listen to in your car to kind of pep you up, it's a good one. But here's the lyrics. I was walking the wayside, lost on a lonely road. I was chasing the high life trying to satisfy my soul. All the lies I believed in left me crying like the rain. Then I saw lightning from heaven and I've never been the same. I'm gonna climb a mountain. I'm gonna shout about it. I am a child of love. I found a world of freedom. I found a friend in Jesus. I am a child of love. I felt the sting of the fire, but I saw you in the flames. Just when I thought it was over, you broke me out of the grave. I'm gonna climb a mountain. I'm gonna shout about it. I am a child of love. Now this song is a good peppy song and it makes you think, yeah, 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 get, where is that mountain? I'm climbing it. I don't even care what it just, I'm, you know, do, 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 do. it's a really good song. But what is that song about? Me. It is about me. It's all about what I'm going to do. No, it's fine. It's a perfectly good song to listen to on the radio or whatever you want. But unfortunately, as Christians, sometimes that's how we see sanctification. That's how we see the Christian life. I'm going to do it. But no. Following is not a doing, it's a dying. In fact, following is also a receiving. 
We receive the power of Christ through His Word, through His body, through His blood in our baptism. You know, it's interesting. The Holy Spirit, I've heard some compare to a transformer. You know, the electrical thing? And what a transformer does is you, you have appliances that need electricity. If there's no electricity, the appliance is worthless. I mean, your refrigerator all day long can say, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to cool down that beef and I'm going to freeze those potatoes. But if there's no electricity, it, nothing. However, the electricity we get comes from the electric grid, which is giant electric output of thousands and thousands of volts. So if you plug your refrigerator into the, you know, right into the, the main electric grid, your refrigerator is going to explode and burn down your house. So we have transformers that, that know how much electricity the utility needs and transforms the main electricity into just the right amount that you need for your utilities. Not too much, but just enough. And Christ tells us that this is the Christian life. In my death, in my ascension, I send you the Holy Spirit. In fact, he tells us dying is living because of the Holy Spirit. Verse 39, whoever finds his life will lose it. Whoever who loses his life for my sake will find it. Now think about it. You're the refrigerator. And there's a power grid. God. If you had some way of just directly plugging your finger into God, it would explode you. You're a sinner. You would die. It would be like Raiders of the Lost Ark. You would melt. The Bible says anything sinful that touches God is destroyed. But in Christ, we have access to the Father. And we are told to now go out and live this Christian life. What happens is, whoever finds his life will lose it. When we let go of our control and put ourselves on that cross and say, Christ, in you I die. In my baptism I am killed. Christ says, awesome. Let me fill that hole with the Holy Spirit. Let me fill that void that you have now opened up with the Holy Spirit. And like that transformer, instead of you futilely trying to be good on your own and nothing happens, or instead of you futilely trying by some whatever way to access the power of God through knowing the right words or doing the right things and just dying in frustration, the Holy Spirit comes like that transformer and says, I'll make you work. I will bring forth the following that you need. In other words, the fireman. When our dear friend Scott was looking at his wife on the floor, probably in panic, and said, I desperately want to help her, but I can't. No matter how hard he tried, what was she? She was a two-man two woman. But he called the fire department. Fire department, of course, big, strong. Why are all firemen so? I mean, even Evan. Evan walks around here in, in his uniform and, you know, everybody gets flustered. What is it about firemen? But the firemen, the firemen come and what happened? Davina's okay. It worked. Is she upset with her husband because he couldn't pick her up? No. She's upset with him because he told me about it. <laughs> but this is the Christian life. This is the Christian life. You receive faith by nothing you can do or do do. That sounded bad. The Christian life is given to you as a gift. But at the same time, faith leads to faithfulness. Faithfulness is following, but following is something you are incapable of without the power of the Holy Spirit working through you, which he does through his word and through his body and blood in the supper. 
In John 14, these things I've spoken to you while I'm still with you, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I've said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you, so let your hearts not be troubled. Do you know that even Jesus, when he took up his cross, got a helper? You remember Simon of Cyrene? Even our Lord had someone help him with his cross. Now, do you really think that that had to be that way? Or do you think he was trying to tell us something? Whoever finds his life will lose it. Whoever does not pick up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. You have been given faith. You are forgiven in your baptism by the cross of Christ. You are forgiven of your sins and of the hope of heaven. But that faith is demanding faithfulness. If you really have faith, your heart is going to desire to follow Christ, to love others, to do some good. But what's most important to remember is that the only hope of doing any of that the only hope of living like that is in the dying, is in the willingness to give that effort over to the one who gave you life in the first place. To the one that gave you life in the first place. In the name of Christ, amen.